Hi, everybody. Welcome to Read Science, where my co-host Jeff and I uh, talk with popular science book authors about how they make their top so compelling and engaging and uh, make the world a little bit smarter about science. And uh, I'm Joanne Manister, a blogger at Scientific American and Science Goddess on Twitter. And we are joined today by the author and photographer of uh, several great books, uh, Theodore, Theodore Gray and Nick Mann. And um, I'll just show the books really quickly. So many of you may be aware of the book, The Elements, the lovely coffee table book, The Elements, which I've reviewed a few times. And perhaps you know the book Mad Science, which I have also reviewed. He has a follow-up to this, which actually I don't think I have. But today we're going to focus on the new book, Molecules. And uh, so I'm really glad you all could be here to join us. We do have a question and answer uh, application that you could uh, ask questions and our guests will answer. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeff to introduce our first guest, Hale. And I understand that uh, the book was, the book Molecules was just arriving in bookstores this past Tuesday. So Teo is out busy promoting the book, and I hope that goes well. And I understand that there is soon going to be an app for molecules as, as well. Teo Gray is a chemist and quite apparently obsessed by the periodic table of elements, literally a table. He has a story to tell about that. For 10 years, he wrote a monthly column for popular science magazine called Gray Matter about things related to chemistry, as far as I could tell, like cooking and blowing things up. Many of my friends will be very delighted to know that he's involved with an embroidery automation company called Pale Gray Labs. He was a partner in creating Touch Press, an app producer, and the publisher for the apps for the elements and molecules. And he was a co-founder of Wolfram Research. And I found in looking for this information that we share at least one thing, which is having had our lives changed by reading Oliver Sacks' memoir, Uncle Tungsten. Welcome to the show, Teo. Hi. Back to you, Joanne. Great. Well, thank you so much, Teo, for joining us. Uh, Teo is actually right here in town at Wolfram Research. So, of course, I'm based at the University of Illinois. His photographer, Nick Mann, is also based here in uh, Champaign-Urbana area. And, um, you know, he's had a run-in with my oldest son, even though they probably don't remember this. But uh, for Nick, Nick is best known as the photographer of the elements, a visual exploration of every atom known in the universe. He grew up and lives in Urbana. In addition to his work with Theo Gray, he has an ongoing personal project of photographing the world's sculpture, architecture, and landscapes in 3D. And outside of photography, his main interest is mountain biking. And uh, I'm just looking at, so here on Read Science, we really, really like to uh, include a lot of people who are involved in creating a book because it's seldom a um, solitary effort on the author's part. So Nick, since I just introduced you, why don't you say hi? And my first question is going to go to you. Hello. Thanks for having us. And Nick is sitting in his studio today. So. Uh, I briefly had a discussion with Nick yesterday as we were testing for the Hangout, and I was curious, how does one, how did you and Teo hook up to get, uh, to start taking pictures of these elements? And if I remember correctly, you were not thinking of a book initially. So why don't you tell us the backstory, and then Teo, feel free to jump in and embellish on the, the facts that Nick's going to share with us. Right. Well, so um, I guess around 2000, 2006, Teo already had the element, was already collecting elements, and um, he brought me in because his hobby was getting out of hand. I, I think Teo might, he should tell the beginning of the story because I don't actually come in. It starts and then I come in a few years later. Um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, the question though is how did I run into you? And, and basically you were kind of, I think... That it was described as homeschooled, but I would really describe it more like feral. Um, <laughs> so, you, you know, you were kind of teaching yourself photography, and I needed some photography done because I had all these elements and couldn't deal with um, uh, getting them all photographed. And 
Um, so we just kind of started working together, and every, you know, like every year after we had uh, finished some project and and gotten a little money maybe and and uh, had some success with it, I always told Nick like, this is not a real job. You know, this is not a future for you. Um, you you can't expect this to continue because that was a that was you know a flash in the pan and it's not going to go on like this. And I don't actually have work for you. And every single time that I say that. You know, something else comes along. We did the book, and then we did the app, and you know, and and now Nick is working for Tet Press, my app publishing company, photographing all kinds of things. He was just in London like a week ago, um, and it's just kind of snowballed. And we just found out there's a, you know, yet another big project that we're going to need to work on. And um, uh, it, it's like I can't get rid of this job because it just keeps coming back with, um, with. With you, you know more unusually bigger projects to be worked on. Um, yeah, so Nick kind of just fell into this and turned out to be incredibly good at it, and is now kind of you know absolutely. I mean, definitely the world expert on photographing elements, but pretty much also uh, the world expert on photographing anything that rotates. Our specialty is kind of doing these uh, uh, interactive rotations for apps where you can spin an object on a turntable. And there's lots of people that have done that, but uh, Nick does it more beautifully by far than anybody else. We have a lot of specialized equipment that we've developed and techniques um, uh, for photographing and for lighting and for processing files that allows us to do this uh, just really better than anybody else. And that's largely uh, Nick's work. Thank oh, you. Right. Yes. Teo holds me to very high standards, so um, that. Yes, that is part of it. So if you can't, uh, if you can't get the app, I know you have a video out there where you've taken Tom Lehrer's song on the elements, and that includes <laughs> images of the rotating elements, some of the work you did. And in fact, I use yeah. that as a trailer for this program. So right, we've we've ended up deploying those rotating images in a bunch of different places. I mean, they're in the app, and there you can spin them with your finger, and it's kind of cool. Um, but you, for example, if you're in Philadelphia, you can go uh, to a place called the Chemical Chemical Heritage Foundation. They have this huge 19 foot high video wall that is basically playing a continuous loop of rotating elements like that, uh, arranged into a little 12 minute program. Um, and you know where it came in very handy that we had this very high resolution photography of lots of rotating elements, um, and that you know we've got displays like that of d different kinds in various different places, and we license it uh, the images to uh, TV shows and you know mm -hmm. publications of all sorts. Uh, because if you want like rare earths, for example, are in the news these days. You hear a lot about rare earths and their the short supply and et cetera, et cetera, and you know if you're a TV producer looking for something to put on your show to do with you know, strontium or, or, or not strontium, but you know, lanthanum or something or cerium or whatever, you very quickly run into us and you very quickly discover that there really isn't anybody else that's got anything like that. Mm. Um, so we end up getting that business. Speaking of, of pictures of elements, here's a, a simple question that came to mind. And I said it says something about the pictures and about your approach to the book, too. This is something you wrote. Um, very early on, I have this as page 10, you say, this sodium has been made into the shape of a duck for absolutely no reason, which I thought was a, a pretty powerful explanation of why it was in the book. But my, the question that came to mind then was, how do you arrive at which, at what things are going to represent what thing that you're talking about? Because there are a lot of very interesting, odd, and sometimes unusual choices. There's the duck. Yeah, here it is. Right. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, so the, there's there's two related problems. In the case of elements, the problem is that they're all gray metals, with almost yeah. no exceptions. And in the case of molecules, they're all white powders, with very um, few which exceptions. Which I, I hope to talk about it more length in a minute. Um, yeah, and it's kind of, it's almost a defining characteristic of you ha having a pure compound that it's white. It's kind of like one way of telling purity in most cases, unless it happens to be, you know, one of the, this very small number of of dye type, you know, colored molecules. Um, uh, so it's, you know, right off the bat, you have to give up on the idea of just showing a lump of each thing in its pure, straightforward form. There's, you know, Time Life published a, a periodic table like that with 
in the 60s, and it was it was nice, but it was 90 plus gray metals one after the other, and it just sort of lacks. So that you know that I took that as the initial challenge is find something different and interesting. And you know, in the case of a, a sodium duck, I mean that's just a shoe in because of course the thing that you do with sodium is you throw it in a lake because it, it, it explodes on contact with water. So you know, if you have a duck made out of sodium. Uh, you know, and that it's was not actually my idea. That was a dental student in Phoenix, Arizona, I believe, who, um, who for whatever reason made a sodium duck and sent it to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wonderful because so you have interaction with the public that uh, inspires your book. Then, uh, yeah, I get I get offers of stuff um, periodically. In fact, there's a guy that's just offered me some um, some. Uh, uh, Counterweights from 747s that are made of depleted uranium, which is marvelous stuff, mm. but I can't accept them um, because they, they, yeah, well, they, they weigh more than 15 pounds, and that would be illegal. So mm -hmm. uh, oh I'm well, probably going to turn them down. While we're on that subject, then, can we go ahead and finish with my question about the curse of the white powder? Why? And I was very interested because I hadn't known, and I'm sorry, it was something useful that I learned from the book about why most of these powders that would be of interest are white to begin with. Well, so chemically speaking, why they're white? I mean, it's because, by yeah. and large, you know, something can be colored only uh, if it absorbs um, light of one color more strongly than another. Uh, if it either absorbs no light at all or absorbs all light equally, then, you know, it'll, it'll basically be either white or black. Um, and it turns out that you know the, the the range of wavelengths of light that correspond to the entire spectrum that we're able to see is pretty narrow, and so it's actually it's kind of difficult chemically to arrange something which doesn't either absorb everything or nothing, and as it happens, just uh, because you have to kind of hit the middle of this very narrow band that we call visible light, and chop off a bit of it but not the rest, and. Uh, it turns out that most chemical bonds and most sort of you know organic molecules that you see you know occurring you know that are molecules of interest, most of the bonds are simply too strong, and the the, uh, the electrons are bound too tightly to allow visible light to knock them out of place. Mm -hmm. You need higher energy light, which would be, for example, ultraviolet light, which has more energy per photon to break those bonds, or not, not necessarily break the bonds, but to kick the electrons out and therefore allow the light to be absorbed. Uh, and that's both why most of these sorts of molecules are white, because they just they don't absorb any light, and why ultraviolet light is harmful, because it's actually powerful enough to start knocking mm -hmm. electrons out and therefore start damaging uh, organic molecules like the ones in your skin or your eyes or wherever. Yeah. All those white powders certainly do have a certain sameness to them, but they do look awfully good on uh, Nick's black turntable. <laughs> That's yeah, a great We really made an effort to find things that were not black powder or white powders that would kind of, you know, represent uh, the the substance without actually being the pure substance in its boring form. And that's mm -hmm. also why there's an entire chapter about um, colors and pigments and right. things like that. You, that's, you know, basically just an excuse to have stuff in there that's good. <laughs> colors. Yeah. One of the challenges or was, or not one of the challenges, but while they're all white, they have different textures to them. So mm -hmm. with a lot of the white powders, what I tried to do was get really close and light them so that you could see that they're still different. Like some of them would really clump up. Some of them would be extremely fine. Um, some of them had small crystals. Some of them didn't. And so they do still look a little bit different. Um, but yeah, all white, lots of white. Yeah, so, so that takes some talent to to set to differentiate them. Uh, so and and it shows these pictures are gorgeous. When you were working with these things, were you in protective gear? Did you have your goggles and gloves and a face <laughs> mask? And some of the um, most of them are completely benign. Like we have a lot of sugars and different sweeteners in there, and that's just benign. You, but um, there were some other things where you just didn't want to inhale it, you didn't want to get it on your skin, so yeah, protective equipment. Um. There was there was one in particular, and I can't recall offhand, but it was the 
the rolled up sheets of something made from asbestos? Was it asbestos? Yeah, it's asbestos shelf liners. Yeah, that you said was the one thing that, that concerned you as you were placing it on the turntable, uh, that it, would, it felt dangerous. Yes, I made Teo place that on the turntable. <laughs> yeah, Nick has a thing about asbestos, and, you know, I guess I do too. It's kind of, you know, there's a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of reasons to not want to expose yourself to antique asbestos objects that are shedding. Um, I, I actually, I just got an object which I so wish we had had in time to put in the book. Um, but so it turns out, you know how cigarettes used to be healthy and good for you and doctors recommended mm -hmm. them? And then at, at some point um, it was decided that that was actually mistaken when ought to have a filter to, you know, you should smoke through a filter. And so, you know, but they made those filters out of initially. <laughs> oh my gosh! So, oh yes. So I actually managed to get on eBay uh, a Air Force One presidential commemorative pack of Kent cigarettes with asbestos filters in them. So it's like you're smoking through asbestos on an airplane. It's <sighs> it's like you know of all it's like that that's an object of its time. Yeah, it was not a much a different time, time, wasn't it? Not, well, not now a, I'm starting to think my dad did actually die uh, from emphysema. But he could have as easily had lung cancer, right, from the time he was smoking cigarettes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I shouldn't laugh, but oh, my goodness. Um, so so you, you have to decide what you're putting in the book, get the images processed, but then you lay everything out. So who helps do this the, this part? Do you have a large part in this in saying well, what? Well, so the, the book layout was done primarily by Matt Coakley. Um, I know but, Matt. Really? Hey, he's so, in popular science. Yeah, right. No, yeah, he's, uh, that's where I first started working with him is he laid out my column in popular science um, for years until he left. And, uh, and my, you know, if you look at the the ten years of that column, you can tell where he was there because they're just more beautiful, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, that um, and after he left, uh, you know, I, he'd done the elements book, and I really, really wanted him to do the molecules book. And generally, the way it works is, you know, I, I initially just, you know, th throw the stuff at him. He just gets a whole bunch of text and a whole bunch of pictures, and I say, you know, just lay it out for purely for the sake of beauty and I'm not even going to tell you which ones are important or, or insignificant or whatever and uh, just do it aesthetically uh, and, and then go through you know line by line page by page and fix all of the things that didn't come out right doing that because you know in some some cases it's really necessary for certain things to be in a certain order and you wouldn't know that unless you kind of read the text in detail or maybe, you know, there's some object which isn't the most beautiful thing in the world, but it's by far the most important one, and it really needs to be bigger. And so, you know, so we go through and uh, kind of adjust it for meaning and comprehension and sensibleness, and then he goes back and, you know, makes it look pretty again. And it's kind of an iterative process, but he's a very talented um, yes. book designer. He's amazing, and so actually I was able to contact him, uh, and he helped me design some slide elements for my very first Pachakucha talk that I gave here in town. So, yes, I've, I've worked with him myself on a very limited basis. So, All yeah, world. this makes this book so much more exciting. So, who, <laughs> who provided all these uh, di the, uh, chemical diagrams? So, the uh, chemical diagrams, um, there's two phases to that. One is to get the, um, what's called a MAL file, which is sort of a a 2D structure file that represents the layout of the molecule. Um, I had uh, an assistant, Deanna, uh, who's um, at the University of Illinois, who sort of wrangled those for me. I got a bunch of them myself, and then um, uh, I had her produce the rest of them. And then, and then the question is how to render it. Um, and you know, you may notice they look different from most people's renderings. They have this kind of glow. Um, so that was a piece of Mathematica code I wrote. Um, that it's it's basically doing kind of a, uh, a a a bogus sort of electrostatic simulation of uh, potential around like if you imagine that that molecule was built out of wire and had electric charges distributed on it corresponding to where the atoms and the bonds are, the glow represents the electric field strength around that, which has no physical meaning and doesn't correspond in any way to electron density in a real molecule, but it looks kind of cool, 
and it had sort of a, a, a smooth organic sort of shape to it that I, I wanted to sort of approximate and remind people of the fact that actually the balls and sticks are complete lies and there are there are no such things in molecules. There's really just soup of electrons um, which are delocalized objects and don't really exist in the sense of being somewhere. Um, you know, and, and all that. But at the same time, you know, have it look recognizable as a diagram and be able to talk about the bonds and have it look pretty and, and also it has to work on a black background. So there had to be like there had to be some kind of a glow behind it. But yeah, it's very aesthetically pleasing. Absolutely. And that, that gives me one chance to uh, to give one of my compliments for the book that I mentioned off air, which is I I really appreciate the abundance of these chemical diagrams. It's it's hours of fun just looking at them and comparing and trying to find the shape and putting them in without lengthy, lengthy, lengthy anal retentive explanations of how one is supposed to use them. Just putting them there to look at and learn from and start to uh, understand the patterns for oneself I think is a brilliant thing and it seems oh, that you God. must have your publisher must be small enough that you didn't have a whole marketing department telling you you must not put equations and diagrams into your uh, book. Well, there is this well-accepted formula in the in the publishing industry that every formula you put in a book will cut its sales in half. Right. Um, I don't know if that applies to chemical diagrams or not, but I mean the reason they're there, I mean there is actually a page where I try to sort of explain, you know, how does bonding work and how do electrons work, and I have a little progression mm -hmm. where I try to, you know, distill the reality of electron density density down and thick and explain why it is that we draw them this way even though it's a total lie um, uh, but what but really you know what I, what I was thinking is uh, I, I've always found generally speaking that if I kind of go with what I think is intriguing and pretty and attractive there will be a certain number of people who also find it that way and that's mm -hmm. the ones I'm trying to talk to um, and I think these things are it's just fascinating they're like little little maps of little cities and they all have their own unique neighborhoods and characteristics and um, you know you can't really understand what's going on without looking at the map and these are the maps uh, and they look Absolutely. nice and, yeah. and in many cases you can see you know you can put them next to each other and you can see patterns in there and I think uh, this may be one reason why so many of my readers are are relatively young um, because you know, that's the kind of age at which people get obsessed with this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, I get all these emails from people from from kids, you know, six year olds who've memorized the periodic table all the way through, which I haven't actually done. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there will be similar ones who are attracted to just the systematic nature of these diagrams and the fact that you can that you can draw them and then you've captured the molecule mm -hmm. in a sense. It's like you you have it in your hand, you have power over it because you've identified it and mapped it out and I think and that gives a, a kind of a, a sense of you know almost comfort and security about these things by having it freeze-dried like that on the page it's no longer a mysterious thing and all those yeah. names names in chemistry are fabulous and you confess to being drawn to it because of that and I'm organic chemistry is if from as an outsider is a fascinating thing to me just because of those those names that are so long and seem to mean something. Uh, I think yeah, there should the be names a are they're, they're a window into um, a really remarkable achievement of being able to understand the system behind this what seemed for for thousands of years like sort of random stuff with random properties. And you know, just like with the elements where you can take this huge amount of um, empirical information about the world. You know, there's this stuff, and it does this if you heat it, and it does this if you combine it with other stuff, and distill it all down into one table, and that's it. Mm -hmm. It's a complete catalog of everything, and it all fits together. It all makes sense. And there was a period of time when it was, you know, there was a transition from we don't understand this stuff. It's very confusing. People argued about it until okay, now we're done. We've got this table, and. You know, the situation with molecules is a little bit like that, where there was a period of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years where people knew a great deal about all of these substances, but didn't understand why, and didn't understand how it fits together, and that finally kind of got figured out. And, you know, it's not that that by no means the end of the enterprise, but it's, there's like, now you can draw these pictures, and you can say, this and this are connected to this in this way, 
and if we use these reagents, we can you know redo the connections, um, and it all fits together in in a systematic way where mm -hmm. you can tell you know you can place things into a system and and understand them comprehensively, which is a very satisfying sort of a thing to do. And it's an example. I mean, like an example of where that isn't the case yet is with biological molecules like proteins mm -hmm. and DNA. Mm -hmm. We're right now at the stage of like, you know, we have this code, we have a table of the DNA code, and it's really great, but, you know, 90% of most <laughs> DNA, we don't actually know what it's doing. We don't, we don't really understand how it works. And there is a system there, but we don't know what that system is. And it's going to be very exciting over the next few decades um, as those pieces fall into place and we really kind of figure it all out. And there will then be another grand system uh, that, you know, that will, where everything will fit together. We're kind of halfway there in the case of biological molecules. Since you, since you almost mentioned them, and while we're here, and then I, I promise to let Joanne talk again, I wondered if, if you would tell us a little story about Friedrich Wohler and his synthesis of urea, and William Perkin and the synthesis of mauve, and why that, those might get mentioned in connection with what's going on in this book. It's a well, rhetorical question, you know. Yeah, so the synthesis of urea, I think, was... Um, so at the time, and I'll get the dates wrong, so I'm not even going to try because I'm not a dates person. Mm -hmm. um, it was sort of in, in the, the transitional period between alchemy and chemistry where uh, the alchemists were, you know, people kind of make fun of them as trying to, you know, make gold from lead or whatever. But really, they were serious students of nature, and they figured out a lot of stuff, and they had a whole naming system um, and you know they they characterized the properties of many many substances, um, and were really the sort of the origins of the science of chemistry it was a, a gradual transition between alchemy and chemistry, and for a long time even when sort of chemistry was becoming a legitimate um, science, people were convinced that there was just something different about organic molecules that mm -hmm. the sort of molecules that were created by living creatures versus inorganic molecules, which, and, and they kind of had a, a, even though they didn't know what the stuff was, they, it was kind of a, I know it when I see it sort of a thing, and they knew which ones were inorganic, and they knew which ones were organic, and they were convinced that only living creatures could create organic molecules, that there was a, a vital life force um, without which uh, it was not possible. It's like you couldn't take inorganic materials and turn them into organic materials other than, um, you know, through living being, uh, and this was, uh, you know, a, a sort of a fundamental part of the worldview that the, the, there was a soul, a life force, or some sort. Um, until Friedrich Wohler came along and simply synthesized urea, which was everyone agreed was an organic molecule, out of inorganic molecules, and it's like it only took one example to completely blow this entire idea out of the water, because if you can do it with one then, you know, who's to say you couldn't do it with others? And it took a little while for this really to kind of sink in, but it eventually was, uh, it was the end of that worldview. The, the vital force and the notion that there was unique chemistry that only living things could do, it washed away, and along with it, a lot of uh, the rest of the sort of mysticism of the alchemists, uh, and, and it helped solidify the... Um, the worldview uh, based on the principle that the world is comprehensible and there's no aspects of it that aren't open to our investigation and, and you know, manipulation. It's a question of understanding and there aren't these kind of mystical barriers beyond which you can't go. So uh, I, I have a question to bounce back to Nick. Um, and the, the question would be, what was the most challenging uh, substance or element to to photograph. Um, you know, I'm even looking at things like this is maybe easy, but to me, I wouldn't think it's easy to capture. You know, just the right flame, or um, <laughs> you know, or are you setting your 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 uh, studio on fire? But maybe I'm wrong that fire is not the most dangerous thing. That there was something else that that was just tricky and challenging and took more more shots than you thought it would. Well. Um I guess there are different degrees of challenging. One of the challenges, Teo was just talking about the urea, um, was that Teo bought 
a a large amount of urine specimens from basically every animal you can have a urine specimen of, and then um, gave them to me in this sealed container. It was kind of like, um, don't open it inside. Um, so that that was a bit of a challenge. Um, I think otherwise, some of the actual photography-wise, some of the vitamins and the... Um, I think the vitamins were the biggest challenge because they're small and I, I feel like I just spent quite a bit of time arranging them and um, trying to make them look nice. So the, 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 the fires, we actually did those in Teo's basement to make sure we didn't set off any kind of fire alarm here. Um, which, of okay. course, we set off a fire alarm there instead. But one of the challenges was that, was we needed a uh, human hair specimen. So Teo uh, decided to get one from his daughter, and um, that was a bit of a challenge, too. Yeah, that, it's kind of hard to steal hair from a teenage girl. They, they <laughs> protect it. Uh, but I needed, I needed like, a standard reference of something I knew for a fact was hair, because you, know, you can buy human hair, which is a little bit creepy, um, but... You know, do you really know that it isn't fake? Right. And likewise, you can buy silk, and do you really know that it isn't fake? And it turns out the way you do this is by burning it, um, and there's this characteristically different way in which it burns. But I needed to have, like, a standard reference so I would know what I'm dealing with. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> there, there's a part in this book that I appreciate, and I think... Um, I think this is really important, and I'm so glad you included this. Well, you talked about this in reference to organic, but this whole idea of what's chemical-free, this idea, <laughs> overarching idea of chemophobia, where people are like, oh, my gosh, it has chemicals. It's really bad. And you included a little bit here um, in reference to organic molecules, um, but why don't you talk about that a little bit for our audience so we can... Um, yeah, sort of clear that up right now. There is nothing that's chemical-free. Well, yeah, I'm, I mean, except for, let's say, light. You know, if you have pure light, <laughs> that doesn't have chemicals in it. Um, but, you know, I think that one of the problems is that, and this is actually an FTC rule, it is actually legal to use the word chem chemical in advertising as a synonym for harmful chemical. So, mm -hmm. in other words... You know, I have a, a, a package of indigo dye that says no chemicals on it. And that that is okay. I mean, that shouldn't be okay because, of course, it's, chem it's made of chemicals. It's, you know, indigo is a chemical, and it's one of the most important chemicals in the history of chemistry, as I say in the book. Um, but it's okay from an advertising standards point of view for them to say it has no chemicals because it's apparently considered everybody understands that what you mean by that is no artificially added chemicals or sort of no extra harmful chemicals put in. There's, you know, it goes unsaid that, that, all, that all the chemicals that were there in the first place are still there, and of course they're full of chemicals. And this is really not a helpful um, sort of bit of public policy. I think that, you know, the question is, like, if you can't use the word chemical to mean what it does, which is pretty much everything um, that anything is made of, what word can you use? I mean, if chemical is going to be redefined to mean harmful, nasty stuff that we don't like, uh, what word have we got left to, to mean you know, what chemical used to mean? And furthermore, um, it's, it's not a useful way of looking at the world to say, you know, is this a synthetic chemical that's been added to something and, and therefore assume that it must be harmful or, you know, this is a natural chemical that's part of the stuff to start with and therefore it must be okay. Because the fact of the matter is that that has nothing to do with it and there's plenty of counterexamples um, of, you know, there's, there's synthetic chemicals that are great to have around and, and we're very happy with them and... Mm -hmm. There's uh, natural chemicals that are quite unpleasant and that you really shouldn't have. Um, and one, one of the examples, which I don't actually make clearly enough in the book, but I kind of figured out this way of talking about it, and, and, I'm, and I'm using this terminology in my talks. So I put up, a, I put up a, a crack cocaine on one side and heroin on the other side. And we have two very beautiful examples of these two things. Um, and one of them is a natural plant extract. Uh, you know, it's like an herbal tea kind of a thing. Cocaine comes from coca leaf. It's a completely natural chemical, whereas heroin is a synthetic chemical. 
And I think most people can appreciate that if you're talking about like the relative merits of these two drugs and which one of them is better for you or worse for you, the fact that one is synthetic and the other is natural is completely irrelevant. It's like it's, it's like that's not even beginning to be something that you would be concerned mm -hmm. about uh, in discussing which of these, you know, what, like, it just doesn't matter. It's like crack and heroin. Who cares uh, where it came from? Uh, <laughs> and yet, that is exactly the starting point for many discussions about many chemicals is, uh, you know, first question, is it synthetic or is it natural? And based on that, um, you know, that's sort of the, the, the starting point for uh, the decisions about whether it's good for you or not. The word for that is prejudice. And it's, you know, it's not a helpful way of dealing with the world. You know, if you start from a prejudiced point of view, uh, you're not going to arrive at the best decisions about what to do. Um, and the fact is, when you get right down to it, everybody loves chemicals. And so, for example, in the, in, the, in the book, we have a picture of asparagus, and we have a list of all the chemicals that are in it. So if you like asparagus, here's the chemicals that you like. These are the ones you like the taste of. Um, we have you know, a picture of, of uh, vanilla extract. It's the most popular mm -hmm. flavoring ingredient in the world. Uh, and then we've got the pictures of the chemicals that you like if you like the taste of vanilla, the principal yeah. one being vanillin. Uh, and there's several other of these substituted benzene rings that you like the taste of if you're a person who likes vanilla. Uh, and, you know... Uh, it, that, that chapter on, on food molecules gave me lots of my things. You started out there by talking about um, this difference that some people manage to see between food that's all natural and doesn't have any chemicals in it versus uh, food that is manufactured and processed and is all chemicals and you say while you're talking about the ingredient list on those processed foods that the real question isn't why these lists are so long it's why they're so short right and yeah because natural foods of course have far longer ingredient lists um, yeah. than processed foods um, I mean, when you were <laughs> you were talking about uh, Ah, sugars, the whole thing of sugars, people can believe the most amazing things. You're talking about the adulteration of honey with high fructose corn syrup. And uh -huh. so here is one of my favorite quotations, of which I thought may have been the first time you used italics in the book. So I knew something important was going on. You said, whether this adulteration has occurred to a particular bottle of honey is, underlined, impossible to determine through any chemical analysis because the sugars in the two products are not distinguishable, neither by a laboratory or by your body. Right, yeah, that was I actually something I heard it. No, um, that, that honey is basically high fructose corn syrup. They're essentially the same thing. I didn't actually well, know that. I working on that. You, you also said you were surprised at how much uh, the flavor of the high fructose corn syrup seemed like honey to you when you presumed that it was uh, going to be more more the result of, of small impurities and things that came in the yeah, honey. Yeah, right. I mean, of course, honey has lots of other stuff. Well, it has lot, not lots. It has sort of small amounts of other stuff that give it color and some you know, unique flavors because different honeys taste different. Um, those are not of particular nutritional significance, but they do obviously affect the flavor, and that's totally legitimate reason to prefer honey over pure high fructose corn syrup. But it is interesting because most people have never tasted, you know, you, like you can't buy pure high fructose corn syrup in the the grocery store, you, you get it in you know lots of different products. But if you go out and find an actual pot of it, um, it tastes incredibly like honey, which which I was I was really kind of surprised. <laughs> I think the real scandal though with sugars and, and artificial sweeteners is um, is the um, the fact that those little packets of sweet and low and things like that uh, <laughs> are mostly that, not. that that are they're mostly glucose. I mean, the package mm -hmm. of Sweet and Low, which is a saccharin-based artificial sweetener, 94% glucose sugar. And the fact that it says four calories on the front is, you know, is legal only because there's an FDA regulation that says if it's less than five calories, you can round down. Mm -hmm. And those packets have four calories of sugar in them. So, you know, this is, again, the sort of natural versus artificial. So I'm kind of diabetic a little bit, and I shouldn't eat too much mm -hmm. sugar. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's just absolutely outrageous that this um, packet of yeah. artificial sweetener is contaminated by a harmful, you know, dangerous to my health natural chemical. Yeah. You and know, I'm that's diabetic. contaminating what should be a pure yeah. synthetic chemical that I want. I'm diabetic by more than a little bit, so now I have to re-examine all of that. But since you just mentioned vanillin... <coughs> oh, wait, Jeff. I just happened to find the page with these on it. 
Oh, um, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah those, I mean, it was just sweeties. sitting here because I wanted to save the picture of the giant cookie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's very nice. And that's very near vanilla. And, and I thought we might as well yeah. I'd like to ask for the story about whether it's the synthetic vanilla or the natural vanilla that's radioactive and why. I'm right. Yeah. So that's another another situation where there's, um, you know, people people adulterate uh, or dilute honey with high fructose corn syrup because it's cheaper. But a far more extreme case of that is vanilla, where uh, you know natural vanilla is extracted from vanilla beans. It's an incredibly labor intensive process. They apparently have to like hand pollinate the vanilla beans, uh, and you know there's plantations in the rainforest that have to you know harvest, and it's it's so so natural vanilla extract is quite expensive. On the other hand, the vanillin molecule is a very simple one. It's very easy to synthesize from all kinds of uh, starting points. And you know, I, I bought like a pound or maybe it was even a kilogram of um, pure vanilla for you know a few dollars on eBay. It's like the stuff is absolutely mm. dirt cheap. Um, and so there's a tremendous temptation. Oh, and, and and it's chemically exactly the same. It's it's literally the same molecule that is the principal flavor ingredient in natural vanilla versus uh, synthetic vanilla. So you know, companies can add any amount of uh, synthetic vanilla and sell it as natural vanilla, and nobody can tell. There's absolutely no way to tell, except radiocarbon dating, essentially. Um, <laughs> so uh, synthetic vanilla, it actually used to be made of wood, and then you really couldn't tell, but it's currently made in, uh, almost entirely from petroleum feedstocks, from stuff which ultimately came from oil. Um, and <laughs> oil is plant material, but it's very, very old plant material. So uh, the way carbon-14 dating, radiocarbon dating works, is that uh, radioactive carbon-14 from the atmosphere is incorporated by plants. They, you know, when they grow in the air, they, they build that CO2, the carbon, into their, into their tissues, and it then decays very slowly. And so oil is very old, and so all the carbon-14 has completely decayed, and synthetic vanilla is therefore not radioactive. Whereas natural vanilla, it came from plants that grew, you know, last year or something. So it's its age is very young, and it therefore contains still pretty much all of the carbon-14 that it got from the atmosphere, and is therefore radioactive um, to a completely insignificant degree, and basically to the same degree that every <laughs> single thing that you eat, everything that grew, whether it's a plant or an animal uh, that you eat, is radioactive with carbon-14. Um, it's not you know, the slightest bit a health concern, um, but nevertheless, it's radioactive, and you can measure that and that is apparently used in detecting, you know, vanilla fraud by looking at whether it's radioactive <laughs> to count as natural. Interesting. Um, I'm going to ask. Uh, go back to Nick a minute. Um, there's so many questions I have. So I, I'm actually looking at. So we did talk about dyes already and about you know the issue of color. How did you do this? Is this actually the glass up against a white background uh, with liquid, or is there some sort of Processing. Mostly, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I actually take particular pride in how well those came out. Um, They're really nice. <laughs> and when I think the app comes out, if you have that, you'll be able to watch the video of the dye stripping in, which um, I think will also look nice. But yeah, it's um, I just very carefully had a setup with a white background and um, the... I had black tape that I very carefully taped out the outline of the glass. And then when the glass is filled with water, that distorts and bends the light around so you can't see the sharp outline of the tape. And, um, and yeah, I, th I think they came out very well. I'm quite happy with that. Yeah, I was impressed with that. Oh, you've got more. Yeah. Well, this, so this, this should be playing video now. If I can get uh, the reflection to go oh, away. Let's try. Mm -hmm. So right now, Teo's holding the uh, app uh, in progress. It's not available yet, right? Yep, not available yet. But you should be seeing that animating. I can't really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely. Yeah, we can see that. Um, so yeah, every one of those is a video of it dropping in there. And um, yep, yeah, I just had a syringe that I was filling up. It's actually very strong dye, so I think I actually... I accidentally dyed some plastic tables and some other things while I was working. Yeah, on. we have a colorful set of tabletops now. Yes, it's, um, everything's very colorful. There was actually another related one, which let me I'm see if I can find the video, which is we also used dye for that was uh, even more exciting, which is these um, tranquilizer darts. Oh. Um, <laughs> 
Oh, yes, and about how quickly they inject with their explosive plungers. Yeah, I'm trying to see if I can find the video of that. It it's, should be coming up here in a moment. I so while, while Teo's looking at for this, I just wanted to let people know that I showed you the book, The Elements, and book Molecules, but uh, we have had a, a past guest, Marcus Chown, and he did a book from the same publisher, same format, called The Solar System, and he also had an app, and all of the apps, the elements and the solar system, um, are very well recognized for being excellent apps. And so if you have those two, I'm sure you're looking forward to the one that comes out for the molecules. So, all yeah, right. so here's, here's a video of, uh, and basically these are, they're like blowgun darts, um, which it turns out you can just order these. Like there's no restrictions on them because they come without any um, tranquilizer <laughs> in them. They're just empty. Uh, but they have a kind of a, an explosive charge. It's like a little cap in the back, and you you can blow them out of a blowgun uh, or a CO2 rifle or something. And we just use the tube. That this maybe Nick is actually getting one. Um, no. Um, <laughs> yes, we we have some oh, of them here. Oh. Yeah, you can see. Yeah. So they're really cool. They have they have a weight on the back with a little spring, and then there's a cap, and then there's a plunger. And so you you blow it. When it hits the animal, uh, there's a needle with a barb, a nasty-looking barb. The needle goes in. Uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's got the little plastic barb thing. Some of them have little wire barbs. And then it, and it stops suddenly, and so the weight keeps traveling. And it hits the cap, and that ignites a little charge. And I don't know how well you can see that, but um, that's what the back of it looks like. Yeah, I don't know if you can kind of make out there's yeah. there's the weight in the spring. Anyway, and so then there's this explosion, and in you know a hundredth of a second or less, the entire contents of the syringe are injected, uh, and uh, that that just must hurt, I think, uh, <laughs> a lot. You got this giant You don't needles. recognize it at the moment. <laughs> yeah, and so we um, we photographed this by setting up a tank of water and filling the dart with with just a dye instead of actual tranquilizer. And shooting it straight down into a kind of a, a barrier, um, and it took, that that took like all day. There was a lot of tries, and the the explosive force is it's pretty good. Like when it it's like a rocket because it it jets out, you know, it shoots the water out. And it's kind of like one of those pop can rockets. So if when the barb failed, sometimes the thing would come shooting back out again and hit the ceiling, um, spraying <laughs> colored dye all over. Right. So when we were doing this, Teo was the one with the blow dart or with the blow gun <laughs> pointing straight down. And so as it when it would not go or yeah, when it would fly back up, there would be a very sharp pointy thing flying back up very close to him. And um, that was Yeah, I think I actually wore goggles that time. I think even I kind of Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You wore goggles after the first time. <laughs> yeah. That yeah, that'll that'll change things very quickly. Um the um, so you know, and even when you were talking about uh, cocaine and heroin, um, so it, you're getting your hands on controlled substances. Um, yeah, there's different ways of photographing this kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, there's it's same with elements too. There's kind of um, uh, you know, there's things that you, sort of corners of the world that you end up with that in where um, you know you really you need to 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 have this stuff because it's part of the world and, the, and you know I don't really believe in burying my head in the sand about the existence of these substances. I get a certain amount of flack um, uh, in, in you know talking about things that some people think one shouldn't talk about especially with kids. Um, I completely reject that worldview. I think it's important to talk about them especially with kids uh, and it's important to recognize that they exist and that they are chemicals also Yes. and that they have properties and that they should be looked at. I mean, cocaine is a great example where, you know, uh, it's for years, for, for generations, was considered a great thing. It was the first dental anesthetic, and, it, you know, dentistry was completely revolutionized by cocaine. Um, and in South America, the tea, you buy it, you know, uh, there's, there's coca leaf and coca tea in the book, which, you know, I just happened to have some friends who'd been in Peru recently and bought it in a tourist shop and brought it back. Mm -hmm. It's like the most ordinary thing. I mean, here we freak out about it, but you know, in other parts of the world, it's just like herbal tea. It's nothing special. It doesn't cause any great trouble. Um, but you know, you take and you transplant it into a different society, into a different 
um, you know, social system, and you learn how to cook it into crack cocaine, and all of a sudden you have, a, you know, a massive societal problem uh, coming from, you know, what what in other parts of the world is just an herbal tea, um, and it's often very subtle differences. Like, like for example, uh, I love the example of ephedrine, which. You know, for quite a while here, until quite recently, was uh, a legal herbal supplement that many people took. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like echinacea or whatever, except it's ephedra. Uh, it comes from a plant people make tea about out of it, and it was eventually decided by the regulatory authorities that this was a bad idea, and so they banned it. Um, and so you can no longer buy ephedra tea, um, but you can buy Sudafed uh, as an over-the-counter, um, well, almost over-the-counter cold medicine. <laughs> And it's almost indistinguishable, um, and you know. And so I have in the, in the book I have both um, ephedra and Sudafed and methamphetamine because it turns out that both of those are incredibly close chemically to methamphetamine, which is you know a highly regulated substance and and um, uh, you know not something you want to get involved with. The differences are very subtle, and some of them are chemical and some of them are sort of societal uh, in in terms of which substances end up being abused. So speaking of, um, <clears throat> you, you talked for a little bit about, you know, the names and, and organization of molecules, but you explained in the beginning of the book that you had, you had to come up with a way to organize this book, to have it make sense to you, uh, or, or a, a, a way to present this, because it is sort of hard to just present molecules. Right. Well, there's too many of them. And the, the beautiful thing about the book about elements is that there's exactly 118 that fit in the standard table. Like my table of contents is predetermined uh, 100 years ago. Uh, well, not quite, but you know, it's like all I have to do is write about each one of these, and I'll be done. And that's half the challenge of a book. That's that's one of the reasons why it took so long to get around to doing the molecules book. Because every time I thought about it, it's like this is completely overwhelming. How could I possibly even start writing about this topic? There's 35 million compounds in uh, in ChemSpider, which is kind of one of these big online databases that you know, and every one of them has a name and a chemical structure and properties that have been measured. And you know, there's there, there's you know, there's that's not the end of it. There's many more that haven't yet been named and studied. There's sort of an infinite number, um, and you know, that's an, an intimidating problem. Plus, they're all white powders, which you know, I wasn't quite sure what to do about that either. Um, and I finally realized was that this, the fact that it was completely impossible to be comprehensive, even to co cover all the categories, would be unrealistic. Um, but th what that meant is that I could just pick and choose and do, you know, the ones that I thought were interesting and try to kind of, you know, put together a set of, of chapters that, you know, each, where each chapter kind of hangs together and has a certain point to it. Uh, and where overall I felt like, you know, gives you a flavor of what chemistry is like, and not be not feel bad about the fact that it wasn't complete. I mean, like, so we have vitamins in there, but we don't have antibiotics. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I, we actually bought a bunch. Um, you know, a bunch of it's like, did you know you can buy pure tetracycline on eBay? Um, you know, <laughs> not surprised. Just order it. It's kind of scary. <laughs> Um, so we got a bunch of antibiotics, and we ended up just like, no, nope, no, nope, you know, we've got it on the line somewhere, um, and it was a sense of freedom actually to know that I'll never be complete. No way that it can ever cover everything. <laughs> so you could do molecules too, right? Mm -hmm. You could do an infinite number. The one place where I kind of, you know, the, the very last chapter, um, uh, uh, I think it's called Machines of Machines Life. Machines of Life. I've got and it's that basically. Here. What it is essentially is punting on proteins and DNA. Right. It's mm -hmm. a short chapter and it doesn't have any molecular diagrams. And basically, what it says is that, well, yes, technically, molecules, uh, proteins, and DNA, they are molecules, but they really aren't molecules in the same sense the rest of the ones in the book are because you don't use the same language and you don't use the same ways of thinking about them as you do with mm -hmm. the, the smaller molecules that are in the rest of the book. You think about them more like information processing machinery. Mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're, there's a code. It's, it's much more computer-like. It's more like programming than it is like chemistry in many ways. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, the implementation of those machines is through chemistry, and there are people who study it at the chemical level. 
but you, it's kind of like you're up a step. You're really dealing with another level, um, uh, a meta level on top of the molecular level, which is you know the way that you need to talk about them for it to make the most sense. And that's a whole other book, um, yeah. which right. may or may not. I mean, the next book I'm going to work on is reactions. Um, okay. Oh, I was going to ask, what's yeah. the next book? Right. Well, it's you know elements, molecules, reactions. It's it'll be a box set. You know, I'm sure at some point, and it's those, <laughs> like, those three. They go together, and they are the three branches of, you know, of how to think about chemistry. And since, since you know, as soon as I started working on elements, I was thinking there are three books here. They go together, yeah. and you know, it'll be, I don't know, eight years or something until that set is finished. But then there would be a sensible fourth one to, to be sort of mega molecules, <laughs> um, the oh, yeah. you know, molecules of life. That would I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but that would be a, you know, a good book to do after reactions, I think. Well, this is a, Nick employed for a while. Yeah. This, yeah, is, this is a good busy. chance for me to make one more little compliment and then do one other little thing that I wanted to do before we're done. The compliment is that this book probably has the most uh, amazing collection of phrases and words in its index that I've ever seen <laughs> in an index. And I thought that was pretty fabulous. I really appreciate just, just I I, I, I the index, looking at the index and seeing all the things that I can I can look up <laughs> is pretty remarkable. And then, uh, Joanne, I don't think we've ever done a survey, but while we have the four of us here, I wanted to find out how many of us can smell asparagus pee. Oh, I can. Yeah. I can. And I can. I don't actually know. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is pretty good. Three out of four with maybe. Okay. <laughs> well, eat some asparagus. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> You'll know. I've never noticed it before, so maybe not. You yeah. might not. So, uh, in interestingly, uh, one thing I want to mention, we're, we're winding down and I want to have you guys say some last words, but if you guys are familiar at all with Teo's sense of humor, You'll love his book because there's always just <laughs> interesting wry phrases, and you know, it's in a way, it's like, hey, this is serious science, but let's not take ourselves way too seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, destroying the atmosphere for fun and profit. Now, come on, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if that's, you were going to be the, the, sodium, the sodium duck, I thought was a great example. Of that. Yeah, there, and there's lots of little phrases. Oh, we're just putting this in here just because, you know. So it's like it, it's it's you know. It, I, it's just a lot of fun. Did you find, did you find the one, the, the joke in the knitting section? Uh, I miss that. I haven't and seen the, it. There's a wool. There's a, um, uh, a, a, it's my favorite joke in the whole book. I don't know if I should give it away or not, but <laughs> there's a... I'm sure I read it because I pay attention to the, the fiber arts things, but now I'm trying to remember what well, we so might there's a, uh, an example of locally grown wool um, that uh, that it's like so. I, I I wanted to have a sheep knitted out of wool. I thought that would be kind of cool. And so it turns yes. out that, that my girlfriend Nina's mom is an avid knitter, and so she started working on knitting a sheep for me. Oh yes, 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 yes. You don't have to give it away. I did see it, and I made some notes someplace. But you can give it away if you want. But it was exceedingly funny example. <laughs> right. Well, I, I'll 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 I'll. I'll I'll give it away because I read somewhere that people hate it when when authors don't like ref try to be coy and refuse to to like <laughs> say something that's in their book as a as a crass attempt to get people to buy it. Um, so anyway, so she started working on this sheep and started knitting the sheep and gave up after having knitted only the rear end of the sheep. Um, <laughs> and uh, I don't know if one of you have the book there. Maybe you can read the the end of that caption. Um, well, this uh, is where. But it's where you say you, this is the only book that has a knitted sheep butt. Well, it? it's, it's what it says. I think it says that the situation we're dealing with here is that um, we have photographed a knitted sheep's butt and put it in a book. Yes. Um, <laughs> which is, in fact, the situation because that's what I had to work with. I had a knitted sheep's butt, and that's all I had. And, you know, we didn't know what else to put it. But, you know, I didn't look to see if knitted sheep's butt was in the index, and I, I really should have checked that. <laughs> Well, okay, so we, we are at the top of the hour. Uh, we don't have advertisers telling us to right now, but we would like to wrap things up. And the way we like to do that is actually to ask uh, our guests if they have anything else to add or maybe mention something you were hoping we would ask. Um, so why don't we start with Nick, and then we'll 
wrap it up with tail. Um, <laughs> I, I think the only thing I have to add is I hope you enjoy the book and um, please read it because my friends all pick up the book and they kind of glance through and they're like, wow, this is so beautiful. And I'm like, thank <laughs> you. But Taya was an excellent author and reading. So um, I hope you enjoy it and please actually read it. <laughs> it's great. Um, it's great information. Teo. Well, I guess I'll, I'll go with the crass motionalism and say buy my book. <laughs> um, and when the app comes out, you should get the app too. It's not really an either or question. You need to get both of them. Uh, if you have an iPad, um, and give it to all your your friends and relatives and kids for Christmas. Yep, uh, Christmas gifts. This right here, Christmas gifts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> versus Elements book. And so, uh, uh, periodicpeople.com. Uh, and I actually have a blog now. If you go to theodoregray.com, it used to be really crappy, but now it's slightly better. And I have an actual blog. And for example, you can see a picture of a uh, a cat that was named after me by a fan recently, which is kind of mm -hmm. fun. And other such things. Um, uh, at theodoregray.com. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. I love your books. Uh, we'll always be a fan, and I look forward to you know however many more years it takes, but looking forward to the next one. And uh, Jeff, as always, it's great to have you as uh, you know here helping ask questions and coming up with great uh, great topics to talk about with our guests. Thanks. Thanks, Joanne. And thanks, Nick. Thanks, Teo, so much for telling us about your book and telling us interesting stories today. And, and thanks to all of you who are watching, and uh, we'll join you again in the near future with another guest on Read Science. Thanks Thank for you. having me.